Mayor Jim McNulty, who was the biggest cheerleader for our city that I ever knew and before since. He, he, he always was thinking big things, of course. Uh, he really put the city in a positive light. Jason Miller uh, writing the play about the city, about his memories growing up in Westside. Uh, he had this idea to film you know, that championship season here in Scranton. And I mean, the buzz was really tremendous at the time. So it was a really big deal, big deal. Lights, camera, action. Filming of that championship season, a movie written by Scranton's own Jason Miller, will begin next month here. It was a great time in Scranton to uh, have the Hollywood stars come, have Jason Miller do some uh, nice stuff uh, for us. Mayor McNulty had been elected in 1981. I came in as the president of the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce and its development companies. At that time, Scranton was just having the hopes of coming out of some economic doldrums. And the economic doldrums uh, actually made up a lot of the backstory of the cha that championship uh, season. It was important to Jim for, that, for the, the country to see Scranton, to see it from his version, from his heart. And, and Jim wanted to make sure that the people that came in felt welcome, and when they left, they felt like they were Scrantonians. And while they were all here, they got to see the heart of Scranton. That was the people. They were the people that were surrounding the community. And, and as Jim always did, Jim would make sure that if they needed the street, they blocked the street and they got the job done. And it was just another way to showcase, um, you know, his hospitality, the city's hospitality, and uh, his vision for bringing bright and cheery, positive things to the city. It shows that Northeastern Pennsylvania can come together for us to have a brighter future, and that's what we're going to continue to do. I just uh, liked uh, Jason as a human being. He was a very kind person. He um, actually married uh, a girl who was Jackie Gleason's daughter. So he really got into the family of Hollywood, and. Uh, I guess he enjoyed it out there for the time he was there and ended up coming back here. I think maybe a divorce, and but he ended up coming back home. Jackie Miller was uh, his real name. And his backyard on Fillmore Avenue, which is only two blocks away from here, and I lived on Garfield Avenue, and uh, my backyard was adjacent to his, so we became friends. and. We would see each other, you know, although he was a few years older than I was. It's still, uh, we would play Sandlot baseball. And uh, everybody back in those days would holler the boy's name, hello, Joe, and the guy would, boy would come out and get his glove and everybody would end up at a Sandlot baseball field down block away from here. That's a church now. And uh, we would, holler his name out and his mother would come out and say he's not going to be playing baseball he's working on his play and I think at that time he was maybe 19 years old 18 years old and uh, we all thought well we'll see what happens but here it turned out to uh, really go places it turned out to be a fantastic uh, play on Broadway and everything I knew he was from Scranton. I had a very good friend, a gentleman by the name of Bill Fox, who was best friends with Jason Miller. I met him a few times, some socially, um, a couple of parties that Bill had had and family affairs, even when Jason was back in Scranton permanently and when, unfortunately, I think he was kind of going downhill in a lot of ways, uh, I still did have some interaction with him. And it was obvious to me that the guy was a very talented man in many, many ways. Uh, he was a genius in many ways. Let's face it, he was a great writer. Uh, he was an excellent actor, as everyone knows from the movies that he did make, especially The Exorcist. Um, I thought initially that this movie, there was a lot of talk when it was being proposed about who was going to star in it, and names were being thrown around that were giants in the industry. And some of those names, of course, did not work out, but the people that they did get 
were all very credible, you know, very famous, very, um, very well known actors and actresses and people that were in it. So it was going to be a quality production. I remember there was some controversy about who was going to uh, produce it. Uh, some of the major studios apparently had turned it down. I know he had trouble getting financing. He had trouble getting everything arranged. But finally it all came together. And there were hopes as, um, that this would be you know, a successful enterprise. It had been an extremely successful play on Broadway. Obviously it had won prizes and awards. It was very well received. I'm Austin Chernick. I am the author of the Canon Film Guide. It is a series of books about an independent film production company, uh, the Canon Group, that was run in the 1980s by a pair of cousins from Israel, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus. They were known during this time for mostly producing B-movies, uh, Chuck Norris films, Charles Bronson films, ninja movies, breakdancing movies. But in this time, they also produced a handful of movies that were shooting for critical acclaim, shooting for respect in Hollywood. These were two outsiders who they most of all wanted to be respected. They wanted to be a real, a major film studio, real players in Hollywood. And to get there, yes, they could make money shooting Chuck Norris movies and releasing them and, and being very successful that way. But they also wanted critical success. And that was something that was hard for them to get. And a movie like that championship season was something that was a, one of their bids to, to get to that place. So you have this outstanding cast, absolutely wonderful cast, one a probably the best cast that Canon ever worked with on one film. And again, they were all willing to do it because they were excited by the project, they were excited by the chance to work with Jason, and they agreed to do it for a small, small, very reduced fee at a, at a huge discount and a share of what the movie would make on the back end. For somebody who's loved anything at all to do with television, it was the greatest thing. It was the greatest thing ever. Um, I didn't know much about Jason at the time, Jason Miller, but I remember it was like, you know, guys coming back to Scranton to make this Pulitzer Prize play into a movie. It was, it was the biggest deal. It's unbelievable. These are all, you know, all of these stars, either prior to or, or immediately after, turned into superstars. My family is a basketball family, and then I married a man here from Scranton that played basketball in Scranton. He's also a big basketball family. So we love that, um, just that theme. But the idea that so many people left to find economic opportunity and would come back home, say, at the holidays or for summer visits, that really resonated and still, I think, resonates today with people. So it wasn't just the fact of the movie. It just wasn't the dollars in the economy. It was also that movie really seemed to capture the spirit of how people felt about their city. I, I could have had a film by, with Columbia and David Beelman in 1977, 76, but I wanted to film it in California, and I didn't think that was right. I didn't think Pasadena was the proper environment, uh, atmospherically, mood, organically for a championship season. The back lot at MGM never looked like Nayog Park, but it didn't matter to Scranton residents, the crowds poured into the park today, not to be a star or a co-star or even to have a speaking part, but to be an extra, a tiny face in the crowd. They came in hats, in strange haircuts, with their dogs and with their own forms of entertainment, but they came to be in the movies. The Chosen were given tickets to next week's shooting and some basic instructions but most of all, the chance to be in that championship season. This took place in 1982, the filming of uh, right here. And this was the opening scene with Mayor Sitkowski. Picture there's hundreds of people here, the production crew, all the things that go along with, with a movie set. I thought it was really cool to have this happening in, in, the, in the town that we live in. There's, there's been movies shot here before, but this, this seemed like on a little bit of a bigger scale. And, and I was an aspiring singer-songwriter at the time. The years roll by and the times have changed and the young... Jim Cullen, a musician from Dunmore, sat down one afternoon and wrote a song called That Championship Season. He had hoped Jason Miller would use it as a theme song. 
It was a shot at uh, success. You know, I was hoping that something would come out of it. Miller decided not to use it, but Cullen didn't give up. He's been cast in the crowd scene of the movie. My wife and I actually ended up in a, in a crowd scene. You know, it's, uh, and we went to see the premiere in New York City at Lowe's. It was in December. And, uh, you know, there we're sitting in the movie theater and, you know, all of a sudden, there we are twice, I think it happened. And, and, and of course, I went, look, there we are. She's, stop it. <laughs> we're in the movies, you know, um, like one of those, uh, you know, old movies about ancient Rome where there's a cast of thousands. We were in that thousand. But Cullen was just one of the hundreds who tried to be what the casting director was looking for. The casting director sized up face after face, turning some away, but apparently finding the right chemistry in others. So what did these hopeful stars do to create that chemistry? There was a, a calling for extras at Nag Park. You had to go up and get a ticket. So I went up to get a ticket, and I got one for my boyfriend. And we both went up the following day to be extras in the movie. We just wanted to be an extra. I didn't expect to have a scene, the only female speaking role scene. I would never, never fathom that. And I was standing there and somebody gave me a balloon to hold. I was holding the balloon and the casting director, Ruth Jossum, she came running at me with her finger pointed at me. You, you. I said, what? She said, you're supposed to be a rose girl. I said, Nobody told me anything about it. I, I don't know anything about it. She said, will you be a rose girl? I said, sure, what do I have to do? She said, just put on a t-shirt and hand out roses to the crowd. I said, I can do that. So I did it and they did a few uh, tapings of it. I went over to Jason Miller and I said to him, are the rose girls finished? Because I wanted to take my shirt off and be an extra in other shots. He said, they are, but you're not. He said, I, I want you for something else. Would you be interested in doing a prom scene? I said, sure, I, I, don't, I would like that. And he said, okay, this boy down there, he said, go tell him that I said to give him my phone number. So I went down and talked to his son, who is now Jason Patrick, and uh, he gave me his number. And I called up there. I talked to Jason. I said, you wanted me for that. And he said, you know what? I want you for something else. Can you come up to Nichols Village and do a reading? I said, sure. I didn't know what it was going to entail, so, but I did it. And what it was, was Martin Sheen was there and a whole lot of other people. And I went with my brother and my boyfriend and we went up and I met Martin Sheen. We sat on a couch and ran through the script and we actually ad-libbed. And Jason loved what we did with the ad-libbing. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll get in touch with you tomorrow and let you know what's going on. And I didn't know it was between me and somebody else. The next day came and went, nothing. I didn't hear anything. And I ran into them again, and he said, um, I didn't make my t decision yet. He said, I'll give you a call. We're going to do a second reading. So I didn't get that call. And finally, a couple days later, I did get a call. And they said, the, the, screening, the reading is off. You're, there's no reading tonight. I said, oh, OK. And she said, well, don't you want to know why? I said, why? Because you got the part. And I was ecstatic. I was really so happy. I was at Nayog for the casting call. Tons of people. They had Stegmeyer beer. They were giving out to everybody. And it was like a big party thing, you know? Stand here, do this, it was exciting. And I wore a red shirt. It was 82, that was the year of the movie. And I figured, let's stand in the middle where they want the crowd scene. So I went right directly in the middle, and they had that da 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 da, -da in the beginning, and you'll see right in the middle a red dot it, it's me right there, my 82 shirt, and I'm looking around and pointing with the horns going off. And as you watch the movie, I'm in the, for about five minutes, you just, I'm in that movie. They didn't cut me. <laughs> it's the, one of the best things I did. 
The first thing I remember is my late assignment editor, Jack Scanella, coming to me and saying, do you want to be in a, in a movie? Jason Miller's coming to town and they need a TV crew. 22 at the time was owned by the McGargy family. So their two sons were doing a summer internship at WDAU. So Kevin Holcomb, whose mom was one of the owners, Frank Reap, whose mom was one of the owners, and somehow they were involved on Lackawanna Avenue, uh, the old wholesale block, on a Sunday afternoon. I guess they spent all day. I don't know if that scene is in the movie. And then something happened. The next time they were going to shoot, Frank Reap was not available. So late Jack Scanella said, Joe, how would you like to be in the movie? So the next shoot, I believe, was on a... I, I might, it may have been on a Saturday at Nayak Park. Um, they were shooting a scene where the elephant, the city elephant died at Nayak Zoo, and um, they needed a camera crew. Some of the boys from 22 were in the process of going Hollywood without even leaving town. New Scene 22 cameraman Joe Butash and Kevin Holcomb are among the many local folks who you should be seeing on the silver screen when Jason Miller's That Championship Season comes to the movie theaters in December. And how are Butash and Holcomb cast? Well, would you believe as television news cameramen? In the movie, you should see them working as a news team with state employee Woody McAndrew playing a television reporter. Now, we were naturally curious about how lensmen feel about being the photographed rather than the photographer. Hollywood Joe Butash said it's a neat experience, long waits and rehearsal after rehearsal notwithstanding. I guess I figured it was going to take some time to uh, get everything right. It seems every scene they shoot at least uh, five or six times before they get it right. So. Okay, tell me a little secret. I understand the thing's coming out in December. Are you anxious to see it? See if you're going to wind up on the cutting room floor? Definitely, definitely. You know I'll be there. Needless to say, I spent the whole day at Nag Park, probably from 7.30 in the morning, probably till 6 p.m. And to the best of my knowledge, none of that scene is in the movie. So I really got a taste for what Hollywood's all about, shooting and reshooting, and none of that was in the movie. When Jason Miller first approached me about coming up here and doing the thing with the elephant, he kind of thought that we could just take this elephant that we had and, and take her anywhere we wanted and do that scene down across from the museum. Uh, well, that wasn't possible. She was not, not a trained elephant. She was a very docile elephant. We never restrained her. She was never restrained until she went to the National Zoo. And she would do just about anything we wanted done. Uh, but when I explained to him that I couldn't make her come out and lay down for any amount of time, I could make her lay down, but she'd get right back up again. So they had to hire a guy from down south someplace, and he came with a trailer with two elephants. In case the one didn't work out right, he brought the second one. Nice little man, I don't remember his name. Um, I worked with him for about a half an hour so I could handle the elephant. And then... Uh, the mayor was on a platform in front of the museum, and he said, I give you Tilly. And I walked across uh, the, the front of the museum there with the elephant. Like a little tidbit about elephants. They all have cracks and breaks in their feet. And they call them rivers in elephants. And uh, it, when they made the rubber one, it had none. And when the man made the trunk, he left one nostril in the center, and they have two all elephants. So we had to correct a few things, and we had to trim some of the one side off it. Uh, it was supposed to be dead for several hours, and of course a dead elephant would bloat on top but go flat on the bottom, and <laughs> that didn't fit either. This park had thousands of people on it, be, hopefully to be in it, to have the camera catch them in a crowd waving. The one scene that did make the cut is when the elephant dies, and the Sikowski's wondering, Mayor Sikowski, how are we gonna get rid of this elephant? They go to a uh, coal mining area in Taylor, the Moffat Coal Colliery. Paul Servino says, I'll take care of it, I'll, I'll bury this elephant in one of my strip mines, and no one's gonna know a thing. Well, until the news shows up, and so basically we surprised Paul Servino. The late Bill McAndrew comes out as the reporter, and basically says, you know, something uh, inappropriate to uh, Servino. And he, I think Bill says something, let's shoot it from here. Get the long lens out and let's shoot it from here. So he does like a report 
that they're trying to embarrass Sitkowski. The film would not have been finished if it wasn't for Scranton. Could not have done it without the, the immense cooperation and help from Scranton. And I used, I used at least uh, 10 actors from Scranton, Scranton Public Theater, the smaller role. Mm -hmm. And they were very good. And they and you know the great faces, the the the, the ethnic mix in Scranton is unbelievable. You know, Polish, Irish, Italian, Lebanese, and the California people were were astounded by it. And it's a, it's a rare beauty to it, and it's it's very sad if it vanishes. Everybody wanted to be his friend, you know, celebrity. Everybody wanted to be his friend. So he was downtown. We were always. Well, you know, as a businessman, I'd go to the bars after work and had that type of happy hour thing. And But we got in, got involved in one way or another. He told me about, naturally, we, we I was curious about the film because I had seen the play in New York and, uh, and I had seen him on television when he received the Pulitzer Prize. And I forget who it was, a morning show. He says, how did you, um, well, how did you get... He says, the mailman came. He says, this is your Pulitzer Prize. She says, I invited him up for a coffee, and, and, that was, and that was it. He was that kind of a guy, and he was uh, a good listener. When he sat at this table there years ago with the people from Philip Horn and, and people from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, and they loved talking to him. He, wanted, he listened. He wanted to hear all about what they do and what they do. He was a listener. I guess that's how playwrights pick up their uh, pick up their information, but that led him into wanting the summer theater festival, the first inaugural play. It was going to be the revival of that championship season, and he was going to star in it, which created a category: the first Pulitzer Prize winner to star in a revival <laughs> of his own show that won the prize. So. We got that together, and uh, there were 28 performances, and I went to 27 as a, they call me the executive producer. I was fixing the grass and doing, I mean, you know, we, we, we really put, it, put our um, heart and soul into the program. And this trophy is what we used in the, um, in the championship season uh, play. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I made it or found it someplace, but the plaque says 1952 Pennsylvania State Championship. That was the play, of course. Class A, Martin Rogers, Tom Daly, Frank Romano, George Zyskowski, and James Daly. It was really one of my wonderful friendships. I had some nice friendships over the years, and certainly that, that was the most unique. Hi, I'm Robert Kobolinski. I'm the owner of the 1970 Pontiac Bonneville. The story of this car is pretty interesting. My father was able to, uh, he was out in Scranton, uh, downtown Scranton. This car was parked in 1981 sometime. He was doing some shopping. He was about 20 years old. And uh, he came back to his car, this car, and found a note on the window. The note was from Jason Miller, and it said, for $500, we'd like to have this car in the film that championship season that we're doing. My father found the note, took it back here to, to this home, our home now, uh, to my grandmother, who's still living, and um, he thought it was a joke. Luckily, my grandmother was able to convince him and said, call the number. And they called the number and found out that they were filming for that championship season soon in Westside Scranton. My father was employed at UPS at the time, and uh, so it so happened that my grandmother took this car and she drove it over to Westside Scranton about three or four days for filming. and. Um, that's basically how the car got in the movie. The car is parked, and I think it was on Rebecca Avenue in Westside Scranton. And uh, I, I picture the, the four main characters walking to the coach's house and to have the likes of guys like, you know, Bruce Dern, Martin Sheen, Paul Servino, um, you know, Stacy Keach walking right up along next side of the car on a, on a local street in Scranton. That's the most memorable scene to me uh, with them standing by the car. So each time I look at the car now, I remember you know, the great celebrities that were standing right next to the, the very car that I'm in. My role, I was just a regular patrolman and we were uh, on duty to uh, protect the stars and crowd control. It was fun, it was exciting. We thought 
Scranton is going to become famous, you know, and uh, it, it was it was a ball. It, it, uh, they fed us, you know, which we weren't used to eating that good food. There's a lot of pretty uh, Hollywood girls bouncing around, you know, where I was 20 years old and uh, I was in the movie when the trailer was here and the Bruce Dern said, I give you Tilly the elephant that really existed. There was a Tilly and uh, and I thought, oh, this is going to be great. Well, when the movie came out, I was in like the, I was in there for one one millionth of a second, you know. And uh, I showed my kids later on on the VHS tape, and he goes, "Daddy, that wasn't you." And I, yeah, Daddy was skinny and had brown hair <laughs> at the time. It, it was fun, and everybody was well behaved, like the citizenry. And uh, there, there was only one problem that I could recall, is when we were filming downtown on Linden Street and. I don't know if it was Servino or Martin Sheen driving up in a Cadillac Eldorado and some lunatic is throwing potatoes out the third floor window at the stars and uh, we had to go up and I, I don't know we told him to knock it off or uh, I, I don't know what ended up with him but uh, he stopped he ran out of potatoes. <laughs> I was a captain in the Scranton police, police department at the time of the filming and I was put in charge of the security detail. But actually, we didn't do much security. It was more crowd control than security. And of course, being with the police department, I had the opportunity to get things for the people there on the production that I was able to get things that they needed. There was a time that they were looking for a, a Cadillac convertible that they wanted to shoot in the film. Of course, I had the access to the airwaves with the police radio, and most people in the city they have access to the radio also. So we put it out over the air and we were able to get the Cadillac convertible. So some of the, those are some of the things we did. I said security, but we did a lot of things other than security. And uh, we did things like if there was shooting film late at night, like down in Taylor at the gym, the high school gym in Taylor, and they were shooting at night and a scene required one of the local beers, I believe it was Gibbons or Stegmeyer, and, and they needed to get some beer to shoot the film. So I, I knew the Cadden Brothers distributors on West Side on Luzerne Street, and I was able to call him personally at his home, and he came out at night and brought the beer down so they could have beer for the shoot. And there were other things like, uh, there, there, a lot of times they would shoot at night and they didn't eat, hadn't eaten for quite a while and they'd be looking for snacks and stuff. So I, I was able to get in touch with Abe's Deli at his home and he came out and made them sandwiches and, and all kind of, uh, salads and stuff, and I took them to places like the local places that were of interest. The one day I took them down to the Coney Island hot dog place because that's like a famous kind of a place in Scranton and uh, things like that. So it's just not only the security and the crowd control, we were available to them for a lot of the stuff that they needed to make the film. So I got very close to a lot of the actors. Those people work very hard. They, they, they start that work in the morning, then they might have to do a shoot in the afternoon and come back at night like they did in Taylor and come back at night and do a shoot at night. So they were, they were kind of busy. The dinners were great. And like I said, I had a detail of guys underneath me. And we had, I think it was four motorcycle men. And they, they brought us in and every time they ate, we ate. So we ate pretty good. I mean, when I'm home at night, uh, I really didn't have to bother my wife about making anything because we ate all day from the film. My uncle Jim, Judge Walsh, was the president judge of Lackawanna County who grew up knowing Jason Miller. And he uh, filmed part of the movie in the judge's chambers in Lackawanna County Courthouse. Here we are in courtroom three of the Lackawanna County Courthouse, which is the ceremonial courtroom and it was used as a backdrop in the movie that championship season. Pay careful attention to the surroundings and you'll see that the city council meetings took place inside this courtroom in the movie. My name is Margaret Bizignani Moyo and I am a judge here in Lackawanna County. I'm, I sit on the Court of Common Pleas and I have since 2010. In the movie, Bruce Dern played the mayor of the city of Scranton. And interestingly enough, this chambers was used 
for his office. And I do remember chuckling though, because he had a stationary bicycle and a television. I moved into this office in 2015 and I am so thrilled and honored to be using this courtroom and these chambers. One of the best parts about watching the movie was seeing the, the locations all around the city. They, they shot in so many different locations, Nayog Park, the Radisson, seeing Lackawanna Avenue before the mall was erected, seeing how it was when I was a kid growing up in the city of Scranton, that was so much fun. Over by the original Coney Island, the scenes that were shot in West Scranton, it, it was so much fun just seeing Scranton through the, the filmmaker's lens. The building here it was built in 1908. It was built by the Delaware Lackawanna and the Western Railroad Company. Construction formed in this building in 1902. William Truesdale, who was the president of the Delaware Lackawanna and Western Railroad Company, he wanted to have a grander building. The original building is actually still standing. It's a few blocks down on Lackawanna Ave. Uh, it's an old brick building, it's still there today. But he wanted something a little grander, something a little, you know, something a little nicer for the guests, you know, something larger. You know, when the building was first built, um, the square footage of the building was about 250 by 88 square feet the diameter of the center of the building. Uh, in 1982, there was about $13 million invested into the renovations here. This was from adding the ballrooms that you see today to enclosing the platform where the guests got off and got on the train um, to just adding all the rooms. When the building was a train station from 1908 until 1970, there was no lodging here. So the building was just all offices, communications rooms, things of that nature. So tons of history in this building. You could talk about it forever. The Tiffany stained glass, uh, if you look at it, the, uh, in the corners, there's the Delaware Lackawanna and the Western uh, Railroad emblems there, which stood for the initials of the railroad. You know, when the building was closed, when it was boarded up, you know, this, I think this made like that Delaware Lackawanna Western committee here, you know, it made them see like, look at this beautiful building here. You know, this building was a national landmark already at the time. You know, why are we not doing anything with it? Right. So, I mean, I think that made a lot of progress as far as the entire city of Scranton goes, because a lot of these buildings were built in, you know, later 1800s, early 1900s, you know, like the courthouse building, like this building here, you know, they're all, you know, old French architecture is what they uh, call the design of it now. Um, you know, they wanted this, they wanted this historic grand look. And, you know, when that era ended, the buildings became, you know, abandoned like they were. Fast forwarding 40 years, I mean, yes, the building has gone through major renovation. Yes, a lot of what was original in 1970 when the last train pulled out of the station is not gonna be original to what it is today. I think we're very lucky to be able to have this building here. My name is John Cognetti, and this is the Samters building. And this building was used in the movie that championship season. And Samters has a long, had a long history in downtown Scranton as being one of the finest department stores that carried men's clothing and women's clothing. It had closed a couple months or maybe a year or two prior to the filming. So Heinerfeld was engaged by the owners to sell the property. So our normal marketing involved some signage on the property. But when we heard that they were gonna film this corner, we quickly came down and put signs in every window almost on both sides of the street. And as a result, you could see our sign. It was an awesome experience to have a movie set in literally my backyard. Um, my mom and my mom's best friend decided to take me there. They thought it'd be a fun experience and it sure was. I was seven years old and of course um, one of the big things was to get autographs from all the movie stars. So I did get um, Paul Servino, Robert Mitchum and Martin Sheen's autographs. So I was, I was the brave one that walked up to them and asked for autographs. I think it's an incredible um, a tribute to the community to have someone come in and do a movie set right in our backyard. My family and I went to the premiere of the movie and it was so exciting to see the people who I literally just saw in person on the big screen. 
I think that the economy is also helped by a movie set being in the area because they really, you know, they visit our stores like the Viewmont Mall, um, visit our restaurants, visit our local motels. So it really does help the local community. I'm proud to do anything involving our community. Um, I think that the more we support our community, the better it will be. And I think Scranton overall is an amazing community. We have a foundation of volunteers and you know companies that give back to the community. So I'm very proud to be part of our community. Yeah, when you first, uh, when you first announced that you were doing this project, had to go to the uh, homestead attic and sure enough found some photos from Dixon City. But like I said, I believe that was the first day of shooting when Hollywood came to Northeastern Pennsylvania. And I came upon this photo that has me and Jason Miller in it. And I'm pretty confident that this was inside the Viewmont Mall. I was t telling you that I spent the whole day up there, I believe, and none of this is in the actual movie. But it was kind of interesting to look back when you look at it. I'm just a young guy there. Jason's, I don't know, probably about 40 years my senior there. And uh, he's bringing Hollywood back to his hometown of Scranton. So it's kind of interesting. So looking at it, it was up, up the parents' attic, but when I found this, I was thrilled that uh, had this photo of me and Jason's nearby. So later on, uh, when he was going to make the movie, uh, I saw him up at uh, the Viewmont Mall, and we started talking, and he asked me if I would like to have a line in the movie. I said, of course. And uh, so the, the scene that we did up there was where Martin Sheen, and I believe it was uh, Stacy Keach, I'm pretty sure, walked down through the mall and there was a, an Elvis Presley contest going on. I was holding my daughter, Jennifer, and they would walk up alongside of me and Martin Sheen would say, what's going on here, some kind of a Elvis Presley? I said, yeah, it's a contest, uh, look alike, and it'll work out great. Well, there were many times that uh, the microphone would rub or something would short out where it would um, cause a cut. And the director would holler and they'd have to do it over again. When we took maybe a half hour break, Martin Sheen started talking to me and, and eventually took my daughter who was maybe four and a half years old. And we had a good conversation together. So it really worked out nice. And unfortunately, they cut that scene. A lot of people, hundreds of people, were very disappointed. Behind me is the old Hamilton grade school, which uh, was used for grade children uh, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And then it was turned over to apartment buildings later on. And in the movie, the actors did a scene when they were walking in Taylor behind Main Street Taylor, which there's an alleyway back there that people can go into their garages and uh, their backyards. And they walk through this area down there. And then all of a sudden they're walking up, which is Rebecca Avenue right here. And that's what they do. They, they walk all the way up and then across and then eventually run up the steps. And they open the door, and uh, when they go in, all of a sudden, it picks up at the old high school in Taylor. So people would think they're, they're still looking at this building behind us. It was really done and pretty ingenious all through the movie, how they did some trickery with the scenes to make it look the same thing, but it could have been four or five different locations. My name is Meg Horger. I am the youngest of five. My father, Peter Horger, uh, this was his house with my mother, Jean. We're located here on the corner of South Main Street and West Atherton Street in Taylor, Pennsylvania. And that championship season was filmed here in June of 1982. One of the old stately houses in Taylor. Uh, this was the place to be and that wraparound porch is absolutely wonderful with the, with the columns. Why don't you come inside and I'll give you a tour of some of the places that they filmed and uh, just walk right this way. This part of the house they rebuilt, actually the whole house was rebuilt in California on a set in Hollywood, but they didn't do any filming inside. They did 
all the filming outside of the house, but you can tell, you know, I can tell anyway, what the original looks like with the staircase and the stained glass compared to the rebuilt one. The actors were on the couches and they were eating pizza. <laughs> and uh, that's when my wife uh, got to autograph a playbill of the original show on Broadway uh, in 1972. And 10 years later, she kept the playbill during that period of time. And when we came down, she got autographs of the actors in 1982. The owner of the house, Peter Horger, uh, who was a first cousin of mine, and I'm a lawyer, and uh, he was approached about signing a contract for the use of this house for that championship season, the filming. And I do remember, and we're going back to 1982, uh, his presenting me with the, the contract, and I thought it was inadequate, as perhaps a lawyer would, and I thought there was negotiating room. And so, uh, without remembering the details, I remember we negotiated the uh, actual consideration, the dollars that would be paid uh, to Peter for the use of this house over a period of time. And I also threw in the house needed a painting on the outside. And so I said, when you're finished production, and this was in the contract, uh, you're going to repaint the house. And they did. I was at work and Pete called me up and said, Jason Miller was just here. He's looking at this house for a movie. And I said, why? It's just an ordinary house. It's just big, that's all. They came and they looked at it the first time. And then they decided that the weather was intractable for that time of year that they were planning it. So they didn't do it. They called it off. And that was pretty sad. We thought we'd make some money. and. Sure enough, a year or two later, they called and wanted to start all over again. They didn't like the design with the two doors e exiting either side. They reconfigured it and just made one door going out to the yard in which they filmed the one scene, another scene at night. Or no, that was during the day, and um, there was no fence back there on the alley. And they went through the hedges and supposedly walked down the alley. But at the end, it was all put back originally to its original state. The backyard scene, when they just spill out into the backyard, just playing catch in a scene with the basketball back and forth to each other. They were just shooting it and their conversation got a little more hostile and they were, you know, that was done right back in the backyard. And there was a basketball hoop up on the garage, so there were some scenes there. So you can see around here the side porch where they saw access as they were driving by to go for pizza. Again, this was one of the reasons that this location was desirable. They saw the access the film crew would have with the yard space and then up again on the porch. This is the scene where Robert Mitchum, after a heated argument, kicked Martin Sheen out and they did the take about six times. And each time Martin was just as good as the last. He was such a an amazing actor. Martin Sheen said to my sister and I how great it must have been to grow up in this house, which was a beautiful thing to say, and it was. We've returned to the scene of the crime. I do believe this is uh, the tree that I did a, a, a news interview at 40 years ago with a song that I wrote called That Championship Season, which was for me uh, and for a lot of people, you know, everybody, Hollywood was coming to Scranton via Jason Miller, who was one of us. 40 years later, it's, it's still exciting to talk about it. It hasn't, it hasn't faded at all, really. Um, a lot of things have faded, but, but the excitement of it hasn't faded. To talk about it is just, it's, it's fun. It, it didn't feel real. It didn't feel like a big deal that what I did was a big deal. To me, it was seeing everything and actually behind the scenes was very interesting to me. I loved how they did the camera would roll in and when they would do a scene with me singly, 
they would have Marty's, the bed, we had a bedroom scene, whereas he came in and he sat on the bed next to me, there were twin beds, and he sat across from me. And when they shot my scene, they would take that whole set apart and put him on a, a milk crate and they would film only me. Then they would do it reversed and I would put my face next to the camera and they, on a crate and they would film him. And then they would do the, lo the long shot. And that I found very interesting. I, I really liked the behind the scenes. I got a phone call from my, my, one of my cousins, I think it was, that said I was mentioned in Newsweek. And it's just, it's mind blowing, like how a small town girl makes it into Newsweek. It was exciting. It was, it was a, a wonderful time of my life. It really was. In uh, 82, I was a young photographer. I started in September of 79, so I was just doing my job about two and a half years. And to be in my live truck, I, I was in that live truck probably for 15 years from the time of that movie until we you know, took it out of service. And now that I recently retired and I've been doing it for over 42 and a half years, it's kind of amazing to look back and see how I portrayed being part of a news crew. It was, it was something, it was definitely something special. This movie, the filming and production was in 1982 when I was in college and I was away at college. And so I actually had never seen the movie until the Historical Society uh, ran it at the Circle Drive-In about five years ago. I think it was probably for the 35th anniversary. And I had so much fun watching it. And um, I just thought it was great. There's so much local lore. My grandmother was fortunate enough. She reads the paper every day at 82 years old. Uh, she smokes a pack of cigarettes every day too. But she, she saw the article in the paper where the documentary was going to be produced for that championship season 40 years later. And she was so excited, she called me in the middle of the day during my work day and said, you have to get in touch with the producer and who's making the film. You've got to get that car in the film because they remember how important it was back then to be able to say, hey, their beautiful car, which was only 12 years old at the time was in a movie, is now 52 years old and still here, still in good shape. You know, it'll bring her so much joy to be able to see this documentary uh, when it's premiered. And uh, now uh, my wife recently, she had a baby three months ago, our daughter Clara, and she'll be able to have these memories preserved by getting the car on film as it once was in 1982, as it will be in 2022, and maybe 40 years down the line at an 80th anniversary of that championship season. Although I don't know who's gonna be producing that one. <laughs> We're in my office building up here on Montage Mountain. We moved in here uh, 22 years ago, and my wife, Judy, who was my partner at the time, and she's the first assistant district attorney now, but we were at a, an auction, and uh, it was at Scranton Prep, if I remember. And this poster, it's the original movie poster, it was displayed at the Westwood Theater, and that came up for auction. And we were there, and we had just built this place, and Judy said, Joe, that's what we need for our conference room because she always would hear me talking about that championship season. So that's how it ended up here. And this was an actual poster that, that hangs in the movie, in the beginning scene, I think, and Bruce Dern signed it. But the cool thing about this poster is the rose, which of course was Jim McNulty's, uh, you know, that was his MO when he was running for mayor. Even when he was mayor, he'd always come hand out a rose. So they adopted that for the movie. This is before VCR tapes. It's like an album, but the movie is, is on there. These were shirts they gave the kids during the filming. And I don't know if there's any other of these floating around anywhere. Somebody might have them. So that's some of the stuff. I grew up with Jason Miller. We used to do pickup football. He was like from Bone Hill, the Bone Hill Indians. And I was down from Lower West Side by the high school. And we would meet at this field, we'd do pickup football. But we never knew him as Jason Miller. I always knew him as Howie. So he knew me as Cookie, and I knew him as Howie. So when, when we get, first got there, uh, Jason Howie, he gave us all, myself and the rest of the policemen, he gave us a $50 bill, was, which was autographed. And being as cheap as I am, I took the $50 bill, and I cashed it, I spent it. <laughs> so the $50 bill was really worth $50. <laughs> And some of the other things, the production company, uh, 
They gave me this wristwatch. It has on the back, it says, uh, many thanks, uh, production company, uh, 1982. So they gave me that wristwatch as a remembrance. And, and one of the other things I got, to, you know, in some of the pictures in the album I have, Robert Mitchum was wearing a pair of sunglasses, and everybody on the set, all the actors and stuff, they all wore these sunglasses. At the time, I guess that was the big thing in Hollywood. They called Porsche Carrera sunglasses. And in the pictures I have, Robert Mitchum is wearing these glasses. So they're, they're kind of a different kind of glass. I have never seen them before. I saw those, they, they kind of fold up. The sides fold down, then they fold in, they fold up, and they fit in this little box like that. So they were all wearing those, so he, got, he gave me a pair of those glasses. And another thing uh, I got from the company, everybody in the company got a jacket. And this is my jacket that they gave me. And on the front of my jacket, uh, it has my name on it. I've never worn this jacket. I just keep it in my closet. I think maybe someday I'll be famous. To me, like, it was, it was a great experience for me. And it's something I will never forget. My grandmother, uh, grew up on uh, Jackson Street in Westside. And her neighbor, her backyard neighbor, was Jackie Miller, is what everybody called him. Then he went to Hollywood and they came to Jason. But uh, they were family friends. And, uh, and Jason knew the Walsh's. Ironically, years and years later, Jason, Jackie Miller, went to my grandmother's funeral and died that day, the same day. Isn't that crazy? Because. Uh, Everybody's there, oh, Jason Miller was here and stuff, and then, then the next thing it was, Jason Miller's dead. Actually, I was sad he was a young man. He had that hometown feeling. He was a hometown boy. He had, he had that, uh, that type of, um, just that mentality. He was that kind of a person. He, you know, he liked people and, and he wasn't, I never heard him putting anybody down. Uh, and he tried to get along with people. He said, I was in Hollywood and I was just lost there. I was just lost there. And uh, he says, I, you know, get involved with drugs and stuff. And it just, and this is exactly what he said. <laughs> you know, I don't know if it's dr dramatized. He said, uh, I'm, he was a great Notre Dame football fan. And um, he said, I'm watching TV and the Notre Dame fight song came on. And at that moment, I said, I'm moving back to Scranton. So that's what he did. His funeral took place at the uh, St. Pat's Church, and uh, Martin Sheen was there. I, it, it was very crowded inside with a lot of uh, people from the acting community and uh, fellow actors that worked with him. So it was more crowded than I was able to get in to the uh, funeral itself, but uh, it was a shock that he passed away. I saw him a few times before he, he passed uh, over in Central City, Scranton, and uh, he, again, he was well liked by everybody around here. The, the best quality or talent of a director is to get the absolute best of everyone around you, from the dolly grip to the actors and treat everyone as a creator. I mean, it's a collective, collaborative art. If you stay there with a, in, 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 people I've worked with an autocratic distance, then I have nothing to do with them. They won't get the best out of me because I don't trust them then. I'll go to what, I, what's safe, what's secure, how I feel secure. But, and that's what I tried to do, you know, uh, motivate uh, and inspire and shape 
and listen to actors. The good actors can tell you a lot. The real good ones can tell you a lot. Uh, and it has been only my first time uh, directing a film, and I was blessed with uh, a, a rare cast. But I would I would hold those principles uh, uh, in a code of how I would direct uh, to create a a a line of communication that has has uh, no detours in terms of ego or who's the boss or. Uh, uh, this is the way it must be done. Uh, none of that. None of that. It's uh, an actor does in, in 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 public what most people do in private, and he must be surrounded by a creative atmosphere, an understanding atmosphere, a tolerant atmosphere, and then you get uh, flights of genius. And looking at the movie now, I find it interesting just because of the not not just because of the story itself, but because of the Scranton connection. It's nice to see those scenes. It's nice that many things that are now gone have been preserved. I thought that some of the portrayals of the Scranton area, of the anthracite area, as they call it, of the coal region, was pretty accurate. A lot of that is disappearing. Uh, a lot of the things that we associate with the coal region that I grew up in are long gone. I grew up in a, a city of calm banks and abandoned mines and people out of work and that kind of thing. And that's long forgotten and not familiar to any of the people that were born uh, in the 70s and 80s and 90s and that are living in Scranton now. They have no memory of the deep impact that the coal industry had had on this region. And the play did capture some of that. I always loved the city. I grew up here. I worked here, made a living, raised my children here. And I was always proud of us. It's a crazy town. My father said, you can go anywhere on this planet and someone will know somebody from Scranton, you know? And, and that happened to me. The one time I, I took my boys to Switzerland. We're walking around the, off a bridge in Lake Luzerne and the lady goes, aren't you Jimmy Walsh? And that's not your wife, you know? And I said, I'm divorced, okay? You know, I, I'm, this is, we're all good here. But I'm there, holy crap, you know? Scranton was, uh, it, it was in need of help, you know, and there was a declining population. Like when my grandmother came here, she, uh, it, it was booming because the coal mines were booming. Everybody came here from Europe to work in the mines and stuff. And um, it, it was a popular town. And then when I started growing up, it kind of felt like it wasn't until, and then this movie came here and it was, uh, it changed a little bit, you know, I wouldn't say it you know, made anybody rich or anything, but it was, it was fun. It was a, a fun, a good thing. I think when Miller, Jason wrote that championship season, it wasn't just about, you know, the old high school basketball team. It was about the city of Scranton. These guys in the play, you know, the whole play and the whole movie is about how tough it is. At the end, they're standing there holding the trophy. And I think that's what Jim McNulty and Jason envisioned with this play in this movie. It's something that was a great thing at the time with hope of great things to come. And here we are. City's a great place to live. Northeastern Pennsylvania is a great place to live. That championship season was our lucky rabbit's foot. Maybe that started the building of confidence in ourselves, in our community, that enabled us to get all of these other things rolling. Making movies is big business. It has both economic benefits and emotional benefits for the community. So I know that the state of Pennsylvania uh, has uh, a movie office. They have uh, tax credits for uh, making uh, movies as well. And they work very hard to get uh, movies made in Pennsylvania, throughout Pennsylvania. We have an incredible quality of life here in Northeastern Pennsylvania and right here in Scranton. We have all these incredible amenities. And as our as the future of work changes, I think that more and more people are looking for a place like Scranton where you can find that food, you can find that culture. You're only a couple hours away from New York. You're a couple hours from Philadelphia, but you can live here. You can stretch out a little bit, have you know a property that's got a little bit of grass, which is hard to do, harder and harder to do in some of the more expensive areas in the surrounding states. So that quality of life is real. And any time that we're showcased, be it through that championship season or the office or the fact that uh, this is the President Joe Biden's hometown, we welcome that because there's a lot of places that people can go 
we want to be one of those destinations to live, work, and play. So any of that that attention is important, and we really hope that more people want to make films here, and not just to help our economy in the short term, but you know, we hope that that becomes an industry here in Scranton. I think it would be gr it would be great if we could get uh, some industry here for uh, making movies. I know there have been some uh, movies made over the past, but I think anytime industry comes into the area, they bring jobs, they're staying in the hotels. It's good for our economy. It's good to put Scranton on the map, which Scranton is on the map. I, I know that because you look at all the major, major motion pictures where there are references to Scranton. I mean, that's always a lot of fun, but it, it would be great to see them come. And we have Beautiful architecture here. We have so much talent here. We know how to grow them. When we could do it, you can go from, you know, North Washington Avenue to the White House with, with President Biden, Senator Casey, and there's so many, and Jason Miller and, and other people. When they go out and they're discovered nationally, the good part about it is they always, like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, click their heels because they know there's no place like home. And when they come home, what do they do? They talk about Scranton uh, on their route to stardom, but they always come home and, and never forgot from where they came. Yeah, Jason Miller's story is one that is really interesting and I think representative of the way a lot of people feel about Scranton, that they leave Scranton to go find opportunity, go to different schools, especially in film school. You're probably not going to film school here in Scranton but go out, experience the world and bring your talents back and want to stay. We have so many people, especially here in the last couple of years after the pandemic that have come home, brought their talents, brought their spouses, brought their families back here to Northeastern Pennsylvania and want to settle down here, want to settle down in a place that, that feels like home. You get that from people you meet from Scranton all over the world. I, I, there's always a Scranton connection. I see why Jason would have wanted to come back here to, to make a movie. I see why he would have wanted to stay. I think that decades later, we have people doing that again, a lot more now just in these last couple of years as remote work has become more uh, ubiquitous. So we're lucky that people really, their heart stays in Scranton after they've left. And we want those folks to come back, not just to make movies, but to live and retire. The years roll by and the times have changed and the young replace the old. There was a time when we were at the top, a time when our hearts were bold. I can still recall the way we played, remembering back that way. I can clearly see what's become of me as I look back on yesterday. That championship season Winners and losers, a time for us all That championship season Winners and losers, rise and they fall That championship season And the memories that won't leave me behind Turn back the hands of time, take me back to when cheers were ringing out for me. Victory was ours, my friend. We were young and strong and free. Put to the test, we came out the best, and we felt like we had won it all. The world was our stage, oh, that's all changed with age, even though I still can recall. Championship season Winners and losers A time for us all That championship season Winners and losers Rise and they fall That championship season And the memories That won't leave me behind